Hello everyone. I'm here today with a quick review of the first book in Jules Verne's Extraordinary Voyages series. I have read and reviewed his book From the Earth to the Moon already, and though I didn't absolutely love it, I found it intriguing enough for me to come back and read some more of his stuff. So starting here with book number one in the series, we have Five Weeks in a Balloon, also called A Journey of Discovery by Three Englishmen in Africa. There's a lot of stuff in it that's really interesting and really fun, although there are also a few aspects of this book that are pretty not fun and just haven't aged well. In particular, if the idea of a book written in 1863 about Englishmen exploring the wild reaches of Africa is already ringing a few alarm bells for you, then, well, more on that in a few minutes. This book is as much about the episodic mini-adventures of each chapter as it is about the overall journey from point A to point B, and since many of these are pretty amusing little adventures, I'm going to just avoid giving away the details, although I am going to mention the overall path taken by the travelers. I think the novel takes place in the year 1863 when it was published. The British had then explored Africa on various expeditions, but all of them were basically disjointed and they hadn't yet been connected to one another. They were also interested in exploring a few specific locations, most notably locating the source of the Nile River. So in the first chapter we meet a scientist explorer who has invented some ballooning improvements that will enable him to conduct a longer journey than anything previously accomplished, reaching up to five weeks in length. He proposes a discovery expedition in which he'll start on the eastern coast of Africa at the island of Zanzibar, off the coast of modern-day Tanzania, and will ride the prevailing winds across the continent, traversing the entire continent in about five weeks and eventually ending up on the western coast. This is an interesting story of exploration and the format works well. Sometimes the level of technical detail can be a bit heavy for modern audiences, but I thought Verne did a pretty solid job of giving enough explanation to satisfy readers' curiosity about things like how exactly the balloon works and how navigation can be achieved by raising the balloon or lowering it to catch different winds. A basic understanding of this ended up being pretty important throughout the novel too, because before our protagonist Dr. Ferguson made his new balloon improvements, the only way to change the balance of whether a balloon is rising or falling was by either letting out gas permanently to reduce lift or throwing stuff overboard to increase lift, which is called ballast. So when malfunctions and other difficulties inevitably occur during the expedition, well, let's just say that there's going to have to be some important stuff thrown overboard as ballast. Furthermore, in spite of the novel's flaws and its simplistic descriptions of African peoples, which I'll get to in a second, its geographic descriptions are rich and detailed. Verne takes his readers on a sort of air safari across many of the most fertile regions of the continent of Africa, taking us past known landmarks and through realistic terrains that reflected the regions as accurately as Verne and other foreigners knew at the time, through the desert of the unexplored region that is now the Central African Republic, which amusingly, as I learned from the Wikipedia summary of the book, is in hindsight not actually a desert, but actually a savanna, but this was simply unknown to the Europeans at the time. And then they head up through the bordering territory of present-day Chad and Niger, to Timbuktu and up the Senegal River through modern-day Senegal and out to the western side of the continent, as you can see on this map that I pulled from the Wikipedia page about the book. If you're skeptical about how Verne was able to write over 40 chapters and have the travelers continue to face new and different obstacles, well, it did work for me, and as long as you don't take things too seriously, you'll hopefully at least find a few of the adventure's mishaps entertaining. They run into a lot of interesting scenarios, from weather to aggressive wild animals of every sort imaginable to, well, uh, bloodthirsty natives. Unfortunately, as an ethnography of the peoples of Africa, this book does not do quite so well. Although probably in line with general attitudes held by Europeans and European-descended Americans of the time, this book is drenched with colonialism, and some pretty racist attitudes about the natives of Africa do frequently pop up. It just has to be mentioned because well, I'm not exactly nitpicking when I say there is racism in this book. Part of the very rationale for why it's so great to take a balloon across Africa instead of traveling on foot is because it's a lot less risky since they won't have to make any contact with the uncivilized natives who have been known to cannibalize previous explorers and whatnot. Now, admittedly, it's quite possible that our travelers would have indeed been quite unwelcomed by the natives had they just traipsed across Africa on foot, so it is complicated in that sense, but I simply mean to say that the portrayal of the native Africans when we read this book is not a particularly nuanced or a humanizing one. It's one that makes it easy to identify them as the bad guys and fits in with common stereotypes of the native African peoples, especially the black ones, as savages. Also, these African peoples, despite often being referred to with real and specific ethnic names like Mandinka, 
are mostly portrayed as simpletons and used for comic relief in scenarios that might be funny if they were in, say, a Looney Tunes cartoon or something, but feel a lot more uncomfortable within this context because of the racial attitudes and stereotypes they've come to exemplify. For example, is it so horrible to have a scene where the local villagers observe a huge balloon floating down from the sky, perceive it as the moon, and then begin to worship their arrivals as deities? In some ways, no. It's actually kind of amusing and maybe something that could actually happen with people who have never seen a hot air balloon before, which to Verne's credit is something that one of his travelers actually does point out. But what is more uncomfortable is this kind of implicit, although sometimes actually explicit, insinuation that the peoples of Africa are backwards in a way that is perhaps reflective of some racial inferiority. Coupled with some commentary about how the region is actually very beautiful and fertile, so perhaps someday the Europeans will be able to come and civilize these savage lands, this didn't seem like something that was done in a satirical or critical way. That is, whenever an English character said something racist, it felt to me that we as readers were meant to be laughing with them, not at them. Now just to be fair, as was mentioned in a review article that I've linked below because I thought it was really interesting, the version of this book that I read was in translation from the original book that was written in French, so some of the nuance and some of the cleverness of Verne's writing may have been lost at times, which means in some cases something may have come across as more racist in the particular English translation that I read as opposed to in the original French writing. Now my point isn't to outright condemn this book, and I have nothing against Verne. All I'm saying is that these are attitudes that are widely considered to be racism nowadays. They are there, and they will hopefully make present-day readers at least a little bit uncomfortable. So if you're not in the mood to navigate these waters right now, consider yourself warned before reading this book, and there's really no shame in that. And if you do want to give this book a shot, which I still personally found worthwhile, then it's definitely interesting and important while reading to just be thinking about what historical attitudes of colonialism and racial or cultural inferiority are reflected in it. Finally, there are a couple scientific aspects of the story that I assume were not well understood at the time because they're bogus in hindsight. My favorite of these was when one of the passengers in the balloon finds himself becoming feverish due to the pestilential mists that are prevalent in certain regions of the African continent, which is a pretty nonsensical explanation, as is the effective solution of flying up a bit higher for a little while where the air is thinner. It makes sense, of course, as a solution if there were really anything wrong with the air, but modern readers will be able to chuckle with me at the absurdity of this passage's attempt to explain why tropical diseases are more prevalent in the tropical regions of Africa. So all things considered, this book was all right. Not even in a sense of it just didn't get my attention, but more in it had its ups and downs. In its best aspects, this book was really entertaining and gave me more of a true sense of exploration than I felt when reading From the Earth to the Moon, which was about the planning of a moonshot rather than any actual travel. It had its funny parts, but unfortunately it's now harder to separate the fun, fictional, adventurous nature of the story from the fact that there are real people and real cultures being described in ways that really could have only reinforced common stereotypes of the time about African peoples. And it's a tough one, and I'll leave it to you to decide whether it's a book that you'd want to read. As for me, I do plan to continue Jules Verne's Extraordinary Voyages, even if not immediately, and the next one up for me will be The Adventures of Captain Hatteras, the tale of an expedition to the North Pole. Until next time, bye and happy reading.